How did Raymond have the vision to see this? What was he looking at? Well, the answer is XI. Let's have a look. This is a moving window and XI on the critical line. Varying the value of sigma has the effect shown. We keep rolling with sigma equal to 1. We now view the real surface on the full critical strip, uh, the imaginary surface, real the real surface swims like a dolphin, the imaginary swims like a person. We see both together. Looking at these coordinated waves, we'd hope to find an expression of this form. Clearly, if f and g are increasing and if absolute value of f minus g is strictly positive and less than a quarter, then the Riemann hypothesis would be very straightforward. Here are the real and imaginary zeros on the critical strip. They definitely look like two interlaced or coordinated waves. To find such a periodic expression, we use the results in Chapter 10 of Edwards and the paper of Bain, Pittman and Yaw. We see the Brownian bridge as an entity of finite but effectively quintessentially unknowable energy. The result is that Xi is equal to the expected value of y to the s, where y to y is the random variable representing the height of the Brownian bridge. Here we see the kernel and the functions relevant to xi as sigma varies. We note that the kernel is effectively the theta function in a somewhat of a convivial, uh, convivial mood. The functional equation which gives us the symmetry rule around 1 for the relevant integrals. The functional equation of xi itself simple substitution in the integral, and a delightful first order approximation, which is very useful and instructive. h in the first two derivatives, note the number of zeros and the scale. So the result on Brownian motion, that is that xi is equal to the expected value, can be written out thus, we apply the functional equation, make integral substitution to obtain these expressions which although not the periodic, obviously periodic uh, functions we were looking for, are indeed exceedingly useful. The real part is equal to the uh, integral against cos, the imaginary part equal to an integral against sine. F and G start out looking like the distribution, but tend to a constant value as T increases. We see the effect of varying sigma. F plus G, F minus G, they look trigonometric. We see the conformal convergence, which just means it maintains its shape, constant factor, and the endpoint equalities. We note in blue the integral constantly equal to zero for all alpha greater than naught. The harmonic cooperation of cos and sine over the range of alpha to achieve constant zero is remarkable and very substantial for what we have to say. The first trinket, our non equality result. With A on the horizontal, B on the vertical ranging from minus 5 to 5, we see the zeros of the two integrals specified. It is clear that every non-zero point on the red line has a neighbourhood which does not intersect the blue line. For the function eta so defined, indeed for a broad class of eta with similar derivative constraints, we have the similar result. When we look at the actual mechanics of producing a zero, we see that the condition for the zero of sine is a equals minus b, while the condition for the zero of cos is a equals minus b plus square root of b basically. The constraints on derivative growth give us a geometry whereby when the real part has a zero, the second derivative has a zero near a half, and when the imaginary part has a zero, the first derivative has a zero near a half. Key result is that if a k are greater than one, sum to one, then there exists some working function such that this is the case, where a and b are clearly functions of sigma and alpha. From the relation with the Brownian bridge, we have our heat kernel style expressions for the real and imaginary parts of xi. We wish to change focus to the oscillatory nature. 
To do that, we simply normalize each of the individual wave functions and choose functions a and b to render those integrals equal. This is always possible. Setting a equal to the calculating a from the derivative of zero and adjusting b so that we have the quality of the integrals. This enables us to express xi as the integral of a sum or the sum of integrals. We start with three wave functions and start increasing t. When it moves out of shape, we increase the number of wave functions and keep increasing t. The pattern is that the number of geometric zeros covered by n wave functions is the nth prime or prime power, as in the column columns on the right. So each of the wave functions represents a prime or a prime power. The primes correspond to the single zero wave functions. For the composite numbers, it's a bit more interesting. They are built from resident zeros. Here's an example with 3 and 5, and 15, the 15th zero. Yes, it really is there. This expression for xi is the expected value of a random variable enables us to write xi as the sum of wave functions. Real wave function shown in green, both graphically and in the formula, as the imaginary is in red. The left graphic represents xi as the sum of series terms. The right graphic represents the integrand as the sum of the individual integrands. Here we see the individual integrands. We look at the sum of the integrands to see the stability of shape or conformal convergence in, uh, in practice. Here we continue to increase t and we'll see that the symmetry that causes the integral against cos to be zero collapses. There it goes. Let's look at the zeros of the individual wave functions. For example, for k equals 3, we have here the wave function. You see as t increases, we have a zero there around 92 for the real part. A zero there at around 98 or so for the imaginary part. Generally, the zeros are in quasi-arithmetic progressions as derived from the geometry of the uh, exponential integrals. We find t must equal this. There's one unique zero. t must equal uh, that for each k. And for the real part, uh, it's, uh, that's the formula for different k. If we look here at the table, that is constructed from the empirical data, we see that our sine zero is indeed 154.2, our real zero is 145.5, so around there. We were thinking of looking for trig functions to reflect the wave motion. What we found are some modified hyperbolic expressions which do almost the same thing in a, in a hyperbolic sort of way. So, in summary, we can say seven things about the function xi. Firstly, it is a sum of wave functions, or can be expressed as a sum of wave functions. Secondly, it can be expressed as the sum of those two integrals, with a and b increasing functions of t and sigma. We also note that the individual primal wave functions have zeros which are in arithmetic, quasi-arithmetic progression and that every real zero has an imaginary zero associated with it which follows it closely and occurs before the next real zero. The k plus first primal wave function generates the kth odd prime power. The issue of the resonance zeros is very interesting, of course. All composite numbers are represented by resonance zeros, or all odd composite numbers are represented by resonance zeros. There's an example of a resonance zero. We look at the 15th, 3 by 5, is the first one that's accessible. And it looks like this. Now there is strong, not strong, there is circumstantial evidence for a connection with the theorem of Guy-Robin. 
the distance between the real and imaginary zeros diminishes as a proportion of wavelength with the degree of resonance. So the more composite a number, the closer they will be together. So the colossally, colossally abundant numbers represent extremal points. Note on the left the different intersection points for the real and imaginary parts. This varying velocity compensates for the differential in period for the two arithmetic progressions of primary zeros.